Vijayakant sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon. Sir, Philological heritage of digital humanities. Dr. Vijay Khan, this is Magesh from NCL. I have joined the call. Just letting you know, we can start whenever uh, as per your convenience. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Magesh, uh, glad to meet Kai with you. Hi. Uh, this is Vijay Khan. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll start one time. One or, within one or two minutes, we'll start. Yeah. That's fine. I am not in a hurry. I'm just letting you know I've joined. Yeah. Uh, may, the initial formalities may take around uh, 10 to in minutes, I think. Yeah, then we can uh, do a, that, is, just a... that is fine. So what I'll do, I'll keep my video off. Whenever okay. uh, the talk starts, I'll keep it on. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Good evening, sir. Good evening, good evening, good evening sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, madam, good evening, madam. Good evening, madam. வெபினார்ட்டி <laughs> 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 Yes, sir. We'll start. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We are starting this webinar. Good evening to one and all. Uh, I invite you for this uh, national webinar on challenges and opportunities in the chemical industries uh, by Dr. Magesh Nandakopal. For this seminar, I invite all of you, our faculty members and uh, candidates in and around India and uh, all the faculty members from other colleges and universities. A warm good evening to all of you. 
uh, as we are going to start this meeting, uh, I ask you to. teachings. Thank you, Lord, for uh, helping us, so oh, Father God, by giving such an opportunity to learn many things in our subjects and other related areas. Even now, we want to thank you for this wonderful uh, seminar uh, will be uh, delivered by Dr. Magesho, Father God, within a few minutes. Father God, I thank you and I bless your holy name and I thank you for the resource person as well as all the uh, candidates, the faculties of Father God. We present this time at your feet. Help us to learn from this uh, webinar, as well as we ask your help to be upon every technological uh, thing, O oh Father, without any interruption from the starting till the end. Let your grace and your hand be upon every part of this program. And thank you once again. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I invite our respected head of the department, Professor Dr. A. Samson Nesaraj, to offer the welcome address. So, good evening, all of you. Thank you very much, madam. Um, on behalf of the Department of Public Chemistry, I welcome all the participants for attending this uh, national webinar on challenges and opportunities in the chemical industries. First of all, I would like to welcome the resource person, uh, Dr. Magis Nandakobal. Principal Scientist and Head, Technology Strategy Group, CSAR, National Chemical Laboratory, NCL Pune, for his presence to deliver his lecture in this national webinar. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the resource person for accepting our invitation to be here to this online platform. Thank you very much, sir. As you know, the innovative products of chemistry lead to cutting edge advancements in medical devices, aerospace, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, computing, cars, fuel, and more nowadays. That's what chemistry enables technological advancements that drive innovation, create jobs, and enhance safety in our everyday lives. Your data says that in 2019, US chemical companies invested more than US dollar 10 billion in research and development, especially in the chemistry R&D. They invested more to innovate than the electronic, automobile, and healthcare industries. The business of chemistry excels every day across the globe, especially to bring new, imaginative, and innovative ideas to market. I would like to briefly tell something about the advancement of chemistry, uh, which exists in different areas of science and technology. When it comes to nanotechnology, nanotechnology has many diverse applications some of which include delivering drugs to specific cells that is targeted drug delivery, repairing damaged human tissues, improving efficiency of solar energy production, and enabling lighter, higher performance plastics for aerospace, construction, and vehicle. These are all some of the advancements of chemistry and nanotechnology. When it comes to computer science and engineering, widespread use of test screens enabled by plastics adhesives and other products of chemistry are employed on cell phones, computer screens, and more. Thinner screens soon will be applied to windows, consumer products, and public displays to enable the increased interactivity and commerce. In aerospace, the products of chemistry, such as plastic space suits that can withstand 600 degree foreign heat temperature ranges are available nowadays. Apart from this, chemistry can apply in any field, when you can see any science and technology, any field you can apply chemistry. Chemistry graduates and postgraduates have much scope to use the knowledge in wide variety of fields, ranging from pharmaceuticals, paints, batteries, fine chemicals, etc. If you consider chemistry R&D in which research is conducted by teams following scientific methods and standards, some examples of the diverse research done by chemistry experts include discovery of new medicines and vaccines. Nowadays, during the pandemic, the uh, research developed by, research actually exhibited by chemists are uh, really great. Apart from that, chemistry can be involved in forensic analysis, 
for criminal cases improving understanding of environmental issues and development of new chemical products and materials ranging from cosmetics paints plastics food etc in my opinion chemistry job opportunities will be there always for the chemists to excel in all the fields to explore the challenges and opportunities exist in the chemical industries especially to the students and researchers and well wishers this webinar is organized i hope that this lecture session will help you to know more about the novel ideas in chemistry about our department we have 15 highly qualified faculty members in chemistry with great exposure in all areas of chemistry such as organic inorganic physical forensic chemistry medicinal nano supramolecular electrochemistry and so on in the department we do offer bsc honors in chemistry msc chemistry bsc in forensic science msc in forensic science and phd in chemistry and forensic science to know more about the department please visit our, visit our website finally i would like to thank the conveners dr v vijaykan associate professor and dr n anandi assistant professor for the initiation to organize this to organize this event during this pandemic i welcome each and every one of you to attend this program thank you very much thank you sir now i invite dr r nandakumar associate professor to give a brief presentation about the department facilities thank you madam i hope my slides uh, is visible and i am audible yes sir yes, yes sir yeah thank you a uh, good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen good afternoon and good morning wherever you are across the globe thank you for the opportunity provided i am here to uh, brief about the applied chemistry profile at the karnia institute of technology and sciences we offer the following programs bsc honors chemistry bsc forensic sciences msc chemistry msc forensic sciences both full time and part time phd in chemistry as well as forensic sciences so we go uh, under the tagline explore the mystery of molecules and materials for the challenges of global change chemistry for tomorrow's world okay. under the thrust areas of uh, karnia institute that is healthcare food water and energy to enlighten and enthuse the students academically ethically and spiritually so that they are empowered to tackle societal challenges is our vision and to serve uh, humanity by attaining high levels of academic excellence professional competence and exemplary values to find solutions to human problems is our mission so this brief presentation goes like this academic programs faculty profile research publications followed by research projects patents students college achievements and finally the labs and the instruments talking about the academic programs offered uh, we offer as i told you a phd uh, in forensic sciences and chemistry and two years msc chemistry two year msc forensic science three year bsc forensic science and three year bsc honors chemistry besides we cater to the other programs such as btec and mtec for elective papers and some core papers and uh, for agricultural programs other arts and science programs as well as five years integrated msc nano science and nano technology program so the credit distribution for bsc honors chemistry is around is 150 out of which 84 for the program core and 8 each for the ability enhancement compulsory skill enhancement elective and project work and uh, generic electives 20 plus specific elective 18 so the highlights of the program is we have in house projects industry internships every semester we have a laboratory it's industry relevant curriculum and we have highly qualified faculty good research ambience wider choice for a lot of electives for the students we give coaching for the competitive exams and they can have the hands on training on the modern instruments available at our institute at our department it's a choice based credit system so the total credits for bsc forensic science is one and the distribution is shown shown here as departmental code general code projects and electives and it's a technology related curriculum which includes uh, crime investigation techniques forensic to toxicology forensic ballistics forensic psychology forensic anthropology so on and so forth the credit distribution for msc chemistry and msc forensic science is 93 which includes general core professional elective in house projects and uh, it's also a choice based system program so all these curriculum includes the two unique uh, laboratories one is called as the modern instrumentation lab the other one is the chemistry in everyday life lab in modern instrumentation lab students will be given hands on training on the instruments like nmr ir hplc glc gc study sim 
electrochemical workstation, UV and photoluminescence, along with partners such as Agilent Technologies, Jasco Broker, etc. In the chemistry of everyday life lab, students will be having uh, training on the preparation of soap, phenol, paint, warm tooth powder, mouthwash, uh, candles, etc., and other domestic uh, products, domestic healthcare products in particular, along with Pelican Biotech. <clears throat> So this is the uh, slide which shows about the faculty and staff, the strength of the faculty and staff. We are totally 16 professors, among which three are professor, four associate professors and nine assistant professors. And the highlight of the department is all the professors are doctorates, sub three technical staff. The faculty achievements, uh, six of the faculty have cleared CSIR net and five of them gate. And seven of the faculty have postdoctoral experience across the globe and two of them have obtained UGC research award and so far the department faculty have published 10 patents. So this is the faculty with postdoctoral research experience from University of Toronto and the University of Calgary, Texas AM University, Catholic mm -hmm. University, Belgium, University Czech Academy of Sciences, Nanyang Technological University, Pohang University of Science and Technology and Eva Women's University from the various uh, countries across the globe. So that these are the, some of the research uh, expertise at uh, Carnia Institute of Technology Department of Chemistry, wherein we work on forensic technology, toxicology, analytical chemistry, electrochemistry and fuel cells, supramolecular chemistry, inorganic and coordination chemistry, and nanomaterials, and synthetic and organic, synthetic organic and medicinal chemistry areas. So for a decade, these are our publications, 412 publications out of which more than 360 are Scopus indexed with an highest impact of 14.695, which is none other than the Journal of American Chemical Society. And we have more than 35 publications in ACS and 30 publications in RSC at an average of 40 publications per year. So this uh, slide shows the funded research projects wherein we have obtained 774.5 not eight lakhs precisely of uh, travel, I mean, of total grant so far received from different funding agencies such as DST, UGC, CPR, IBRNS, uh, DBT, etc. So the total grant, as I told it is 774.08 out of which 668.40 lakhs have been completed. And uh, from the uh, Board of Research in Nuclear Sciences Department of Atomic Energy and DST SERB Startup and DST Technology Development Program, a nearly uh, 105.68 uh, lakhs project is currently ongoing in our department. So this is completed funded projects. We have obtained from DST Water Technology Initiative, Central Power Research, uh, Power Research Initiative, and then UGC uh, Research Associateships and uh, from Young Scientist Cream from Science and Engineering Research Board and uh, Extramural Research Grant. Besides, we have obtained uh, funding for conferences from BRNS, DAE, DST, CRB, and in Indian Academy of Sciences, et cetera, for a tune of 3.2. So these are all the outcomes so far, 275 research publications and 12 major instruments and 14 minor instruments have been purchased. We have conducted uh, science academics lecture workshop, industry academia workshop, and uh, hands-on training for students. Our own students, besides uh, students from other institutes have been given training and we have uh, constructed new labs, research labs, and 12 JRF and 20 project assistants have been trained so far. And uh, we had three patents out of this project outcomes. So these are all some of the patents which have been filed, published, and recently one of the patent has been granted. Dr. Parameshwari Arun, Associate Professor, a method of decolorization of dyeing waste water by electrocoagulation using titanium dioxide coated aluminum electrode. These are some other uh, patents filed and published so far from the Department of Chemistry, Applied Chemistry. And Department of Applied Chemistry works with uh, different uh, disciplines like uh, computer science, biotech, physics, Tripoli, Water Institute, Mathematics, so on. Uh, in terms of projects, national and inter international research publications, chemical analysis, instrumentations, and for knowledge, knowledge transfer as an interdisciplinary area of research at KITS. This slide shows the uh, some of our uh, proud alumni who are uh, located at the various parts of the world. Dr. Srikesh in Abu Dhabi, Dr. Uh, Suresh at uh, Zagreb, Croatia, our MSc chemistry student, Dr. Sheikh Gospereira, 
elevated up to an assistant professor at Kim Yong University Republic of Korea. Dr. Nagarajan, Dr. Sivaraj, Dr. Ravi Chandran are doing their PDF at uh, Republic of Korea. Dr. Chidambaram is uh, doing his PDF at Ben Gurion University at Israel and Dr. E. Nyana Prakasham at Chile, Will Morgan at uh, China and Dr. Govindan at Republic of Korea. And the other achievements of the students and scholars, uh, students have obtained UGC Rajiv Gandhi Fellowship. Two of them have obtained the CSIR Senior Research Fellowship and two of them have cleared CSIR NET exam. And postgraduate Indira Gandhi Scholarship for single uh, girl child, three of them have obtained and one student have got the UGC Merit Scholarship and two of them have got the Tamil Nadu State Council for Science and Technology Best Student Projects. Besides two of them have obtained the Silver Jubilee Fellowship and 18 of, of our scholars who have completed doctorate, doctoral degree have got their postdoctoral fellowship. Of course, four of uh, the doctorates who have completed from Department of Applied Chemistry have obtained National Postdoctoral Fellowship and uh, even uh, to a tune of about three lakhs have been obtained from our own management as Karunia short term research grant as seed money. And more than 60 of our students and scholars have obtained best oral and poster uh, presentation from various conferences, seminars, workshops attended and more than 31 students have, have been obtained the PhD so far from the Department of Light Chemistry. Besides, we have a uh, unique uh, program called as the IASTE, International Association for Exchange of Students for Technical Expertise. In this uh, unique program, students from abroad visit our portals to do their interns for a period of six months to one year. And our own students will go to different parts of the world to do this uh, internship programs. We have got uh, students from Germany and Tunisia and our own students have gone to Portugal and Ghana earlier. So these are all some of the faculty who have contributed to the edited books. There are many, these are the highlights of the books. And several uh, faculty are there in the members. They serve as editor-in-chief, uh, editorial board member, uh, so on. And many of our faculty are in different professional associations, including American Chemical Society, Korean Chemical Society, Indian Chemistry Teachers Association, etc. So uh, we have conducted many uh, conferences. The highlight conference which is held in February 2004, which is uh, Innovation in Chemistry, Health and Energy, sponsored by uh, SERB and BRNS, and then followed by the uh, Science Academy sponsored workshop, supported by Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Ac Science Academy, and the National Academy of Sciences during February 2015. And very recently, last year in the month of March, we have conducted first international conference on frontiers in chemical sciences. ICFC is uh, professors across the many nations uh, come over, came over to our portals and delivered their lectures among and also eminent scientists across India have come to our portals. This is a, these are the glimpse of uh, photos which have taken place during that conference period. And we have several academic interactions, both, both as national and international, with uh, JSS uh, Academy of Higher Education, Sikri, Bharadiyar, Technion University, and then uh, National University of Singapore, University of Calgary, et cetera. We have industry interactions with Brooker, Neoscience, Synthite, Biocon, <coughs> Unilever, Dr. Reddy's, et cetera. And these are some of the students' activities which they do uh, during their uh, period of study or in period of stay at uh, Karnia Institute of Technology and Sciences. Along with the uh, professor's student, uh, they design a magazine called as Chemlight, which will be uh, issued every six months in the department covering up all the significant achievements done by the students, scholars, as well as the professors. And students go for industrial visits. This is one among that isotope hydrology divisions where the students have visited that. And this is a training which they have the, uh, the preparation of soaps, oil, et cetera. They call the uh, persons uh, from the nearby village. They give them. And also our students go to the nearby villages as an outreach program and give them training of preparing all these things so as to become a startup uh, uh, for an industry later on to go towards an entrepreneur. This is about the intra infrastructure and learning resources. This is our uh, research lab, UV lab, and PG lab. And we have major instruments like GC, IR spectrophotometer, UV visible spectrophotometer, HPLC, biodiesel ransomant, electrospinning unit, spectrofluorometer, HPLC mass facilities, and also the NMR from Bruca. These are all some of the minor equipments, muffle furnace, rotor evaporator, flash chromatography, centrifugations, machine, et cetera. 
So thank you for the opportunity. This is the website www.karunia.edu, wherein if you get into the admission portal, you'll be getting a form like this expression of interest. Any of you willing to do pick up any of these courses, BSc Forensic Sciences, BSc Honors Chemistry, MSc Forensic Sciences, MSc Chemistry, PhD Chemistry and Forensic Science, both full-time and part-time. Besides other engineering arts, agriculture and science program, please visit our website and do give your expression of interest. We will get you back. Thank you. Thank you for providing this opportunity once again. Thank you, sir, for the brief presentation about our department facilities. Now I invite uh, Dr. Vijay Khan to introduce the resource person. Uh, thank you, madam, for giving the opportunity. Hello, hope I can. I am audible. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on challenges and uh, opportunities in chemical industries. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Magesh Nandubopal, Principal Scientist and uh, Head uh, Technology Strategy Group, CSAR, NCL Pune. So before introducing uh, him, I have to thank my friend uh, Krishna Murthy, who is working in NCL, who uh, introduced uh, me, uh, uh, Dr. Magesh, to me so that I, we can get the opportunity to uh, get uh, hear a lecture from him. Sir, sir, for your information, uh, Dr. Magesh, one uh, alumni from NCL is working with us. Dr. Emmanuel, is, he has got PhD from uh, NCL and now at present he is uh, uh, working with us. He is organ is basically it? organic chemist. Yeah. It's excellent to hear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For the younger audience, for uh, since it's a wide range of audience uh, we are having, uh, for younger students, and uh, please uh, know that there are 38 uh, uh, CSCR research lab in India. They are unique in their own area of the interest and they have the industrial interaction. Okay, so whatever the, the different kind of not only chemistry, different type of CSCR institutes are there. This is for your information. Okay, and uh, coming to Dr. Magesh, so he received his integrated uh, MSc from University of uh, Madras and then he got his uh, PhD uh, uh, from University of uh, Connecticut with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, Dr. Woods. And then uh, he is a broad, broad area of interest are polymer science and uh, solid state NMR. And his main interests are plastic waste management and uh, sustainability, I suppose. He has also received MBA degree in finance from University of Connecticut and uh, Clavening Rolls-Royce Science Technology Innovation Fellowship to study at University of Oxford. He has published many research papers in this area. He has worked as a research associate, research analyst, and uh, investment manager before joining NCL Pune. He joined in NCL in uh, 2009, and at present, uh, he is the principal scientist and the uh, head technology strategy group at uh, NCL. Some of his roles include creating a technology roadmap and a strategy for the organization, techno commercial assessment of R&D project, innovation management, technology transfer and uh, commercialization, IP management, and uh, technology uh, evaluation, creation of spin-offs, building and nurturing the innovation ecosystem. Okay, but coming to today's topic, everybody, whenever we talk about the plastic, we, uh, plastic is uh, invariable. We have to use plastic. So without plastic, how the value will be, we cannot imagine. So in that, if we think about the polyethylene tetralate, PET, it is a common thermoplastic polymer and is used for various purposes, including the fibers of uh, clothing, containers for liquids and foods, and the, uh, with the combination of glass fibers also. Okay, it is used for engineering uh, resins. But whenever we talk about the plastic, immediately the cuisine, the environment will ask. So how do you, what will you do after that? Okay, the first question we think about is the re how we can uh, recycling. So under the excellent topic he has suggested is speaker, sustainability. That's a wonderful word. So we, we are happy to hear the audience uh, about the sustainability of uh, uh, sustainability of uh, plastic. Hope it will be entertaining to the audience. Dr. Magesh, now the session is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samson Desaraj and Dr. Vijay Khan for the kind invitation uh, to speak to your students and your professors and your university at large. And uh, good evening to all of you. Happy to be here. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, so I'll give you a little bit of sense of, uh, uh, so let me share my screen first. 
Okay, I think you might have to enable me to share the screen. Whoever is hosting you, you would have to enable me to share the screen. So while that is happening, I will tell you, see the topic is sustainability of plastics. I won't be talking too much science today. So if you are expecting to hear a lot of science, you will be disappointed. If you are dreading to hear a lot of science, then you'll be very happy that no, not much science is going to be. So I'm going to talk about what are the different types of plastics that are used, what is the scale at which it is used, what are the different applications for which it is used, and what happens to it after you have, you have used and thrown it out of your you know, out of your house, what happens to the plastic. I will take a couple of very specific examples and run you through what exactly happens to that individual item of plastic item, you know, how it ends up where it ends up. And we'll also talk about issues which are preventing or which are kind of hindering the recyclability of plastics. How we can make a difference. As researchers and students, you can look at opportunities to uh, increase the sustainability and increase, increase the recyclability of these plastics. So that is the broad uh, Still, so whoever is hosting, you would have to go to my, uh, I am registered as Magesh. You would have to go to my participation, I mean, identify me and disable or enable me to share, share the screen because I am not able to share it. Sir, one second, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I made uh, Dr. Magesh as co-host now. Got it, got it. Now I'm able to share the screen. So let's uh, let's proceed. I'm... Are you able to see my screen? If I go on full screen mode, please let me know if it if you are able to see it. Yes, Dr. Magesh. Okay. Oh, my slides are visible. I do believe they have two uh, postdoc opportunities. All right, let's move into the talk. Um, see, first, I just wanted to give you a sense of how much plastics we consume as a country. So this captures all of thermoplastics. If you are uh, people who are aware with the field of plastics, there are plastics are categorized into two broad categories. One is called thermoplastics, one is thermosets. Thermoplastics are a type of plastics which you can melt and reform into a different object. So you don't have to go back to the chemical uh, components of it. So polymers are no, madam. from monomers and uh, you don't have to go back to monomers to make a different object. You can just melt and reform it. So they, were, they are called the more plastics. About 85% to 90% of all the plastics that are produced and used come under this category called the more plastics. There is another 10% of the uh, by, you know, by weight, which is uh, that category is called thermosets. Thermosets are plastics which you cannot, they are covalently uh, cross-linked. So you cannot really melt and reform them. You need to break them down into uh, their chemical components by depolymerizing them, or you will just have to burn them in, you know, and uh, get energy recovery. So thermosets are a little more difficult to recycle, but more than 85% of the plastics that we use are thermoplastics. And uh, in 2016-17, when I collected this data, India, the total plastic consumption for thermoplastics is about 
14,000 kilotons. In million tons, if you want to say, it is about 14.5 million tons of plastics was consumed, thermoplastics was consumed in India in one year between 2016-17. So what types of plastics are there? There's polyethylene, polypropylene, polyvinyl chloride, polystyrene, extended polystyrene, polyethylene delta lake, which is the PET bottles, which come, you know, mineral water bottles and all these uh, other applications that you see, and a whole host of other uh, engineering plastics and specialty plastics are consumed. If you look at by application, what kind of plastics get used where? You can see that the size of the bubble, it's a very, it's a kind of a busy chart. So if you look at the size of the bubble, which means that, that it's a, it represents the volume by weight. Uh, so this much, uh, a good deal of polyethylene goes into packaging and so does uh, different types of polyethylene, polypropylene and uh, polyethylene terephthalate. PET. So a lot of it, so more than 40% of all the plastics produced are used in packaging applications. And then comes building and construction and automotive applications, electrical applications, agriculture, household, and sports, and all the other applications combined constitute about 16 to 17 percent. So packaging is the by far the biggest application for plastics. This is the what I showed earlier was the world uh, consumption figure. So this is for India. In India about 43% of plastics are used in packaging application, followed by housing and infrastructure and automotive applications and others. So what happens to plastic waste when it comes to the waste stream? So there are many things that you can do with it. If you don't do anything, it just leaks into the environment. So you throw a bottle of plastic or like a plastic cover out into the road, it will probably end up clogging a drain or ending up in a waterway because when the monsoons come, they get washed away, they go to the rivers and streams and clog the drain pipes and end up in the ocean. So if you so you have to make an effort by not throwing out plastic waste because if you throw it out, it will end up in the environment and it will like pollute the environment. So what are the responsible ways of dealing with plastic waste? So one is landfilling, which is not a great option, but it is still a better option than leaking into the environment. What do they mean by landfill? They collect all the plastic waste, they take it to a site, they dump it there, and in a certain way, if you do landfilling right, uh, you sort of make certain provisions for gas, recover, gas release and things like that, or you just go dump it in a particular place and make sure that it doesn't get washed off when the rains come. So you do some kind of a protection to make sure that these products are not washed off in the rain and during the monsoon season. So that is landfill. So if you go to this side, what is mechanical recycling? So thermoplastics are mechanically recyclable. What they, what we mean by that is you can actually melt uh, a thermoplastic item and reform it into a certain either using a mold or a extruder. You can reform it into a in a different time. And there will be a little bit of loss of property when you do mechanical recycling, but so you still can find application to that particular plastic item. We will see some examples of this during the talk. There is another way, method of recycling, which is thermochemical recycling. Basically you apply temperature and you apply chemicals to recycle. it. So what happens there? You depolymerize. So one option of the one option is like you add catalysts and uh, you know, under certain reaction conditions, you basically break down the polymer into its constituent chemicals and you depolymerize and you try to bring it back to a polymer using other, other methods. There is gasification and pyrolysis. So this is basically applying a lot of heat either in the absence of air or in the mild presence of air to create some kind of in pyrolysis, you get a pyrolysis of oil. In gasification, you get syngas. Syngas is a combination of hydrogen and carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and a little bit of carbon dioxide is also present. So then you use syngas to make other things. And pyrolysis oil, you use it as a low-grade fuel. That is one way of doing it. Energy recovery. So many of you know that 
plastics are made from petrol petrol is the raw material petroleum products and crude oil is the raw material for plastics so they have lot of calorific value you can burn them in a certain way to recover the energy you can basically use them as a fuel that doesn't mean this burning activity can happen in the open so if you see somebody burning a, a pile of plastic please ask them not to do it in an open atmosphere because first of all it is not good for them the gases and the chemicals that are released while burning plastic in open plastic is supposed to be burnt in a contained atmosphere when the output is monitored and like you know made sure the toxic fumes are not in, uh, let out into the into the atmosphere so it has to be done in a controlled way it can't just be done in an open space and wherever you feel like you just can't take some bunch of plastic and start burning it so but if you if you apply heat in the right way and this burning operation you can actually recover energy back from the plastics and the fourth option is composting if you you might have heard of uh, biodegradable plastics they are like for example polylactic acid so polylactic acid is a very popular biodegradable plastic it is used for implants so when you go for knee surgery or like you know and it is used in a wide range of uh, biomedical implants and also in packaging where you can pack food items and things like that using polylactic acid it is in principle a biodegradable plastic so but we but we need to understand what do they mean by biodegradable it doesn't mean that if you just throw it out into the open it will just disappear it won't it has to be composted at a certain certain conditions under composting if you compost it properly it will break down into smaller bits and it will degrade so they are called biodegradable plastics and we already looked at landfill and leakage into the environment so these are all various ways in which you can deal with plastic waste so this is a which i borrowed from a report called the new plastics economy report this is a pictorial representation of what happens so you start from refining you basically take crude oil or fossil bay fossil fuel and you refine it into constituent chemicals petrol monomers ethylene propylene and uh, you make polymerize them into polymers and then when the polymers are made uh, i'll just give you a, for example see this is a water bottle right so this is a plastic right so it comes from the raw material for this it's most likely polypropylene water bottle uh, most likely the material we used is polypropylene some grades of polypropylene maybe a little bit of polyethylene is there blended but polypropylene so they start with propylene and then they polymerize it comes as a beads so it comes as a colorless or white bead called resin but resin is not directly used to make a make this water bottle because there is a uh, additional step called compounding so the compounding is made, you add a few other chemicals to it you make add those chemicals one is the color so you add <laughs> and other is certain other chemicals to make the processing easier you compound it. and then you get a compounded polymer and then you somebody is so this is an injection molded bottle so somebody that compounded material in an injection molded uh, injection mold to make this bottle so the cap is made separately the cap is made of a different material and that is also injection molded and the bottle is made of a slightly different material both two different injection molding parts and then put together and then you have a bottle in there and once you use your and the you, you you use the bottle and then you throw it out once you throw it out it gets if you don't throw it out outside the you know here and there and like you know if you actually put it in a dustbin and those that the dustbin gets collected by the local municipality or the panchayat or like whoever is the local body who collects it if they collect it and segregate the plastic this can be this can be for this can be taken back into a uh, used in other applications so there is something called closed loop mechanical reasoning meaning this bottle can be melted add uh, some more chemicals to be added to bring up the properties and then made into a bottle again so this is a closed loop so you start with a bottle you end with a bottle so you keep doing this over and over again not forever but a few times at least before the properties and there is something called open loop mechanical 
which means from a bottle you don't go back to a bottle but you make something else so you make some other product product like a stool or a chair or garden you know if you see these pots plastic pots that you put plants in so those kinds of things are called open loop because you start from a bottle or you start from an application but you find some other application for the recycled product chemical recycling basically breaks down this into a its constituent chemicals where it started propylene so if not possibly propylene then what else can you be polymerized into so then you take those chemicals and then you feed it back into the refinery and then you start making materials again so this is roughly what could be done that doesn't mean that all of it all of the plastics gets recycled this way but these are all possibilities technically all of this is feasible technically all thermoplastic can be mechanically recycled or chemically recycled and thermosets can be chemically recycled or there are other ways to break down and use it for you know either in pyrolysis or in energy recovery kind of an application so the question is what do we do with it? so do you do mechanical recycling or do you do chemical recycling uh, what kind of a, do you landfill it or what happens what do you do with a plastic or a, any a, any plastic item that that is um, after you use it what happens to it so first thing we should recognize that these materials are have lot of value so this material has lot of even if i have finished using it this still has a lot of value so there is still stuff can be made from it there is still energy that can be recovered from it it is made from petrol so it, you can actually do energy recovery or you can make something else from it as long as you have not there are certain things that you have not done with it. for example if you don't throw it if you go and throw it somewhere out outside your house in the middle of nowhere nobody is going to pick it up and recycle it so then it is won't, won't get recycled but what are the things that we can do so i will take you through some examples instead of me telling you what how it gets done i will give you an example so that it's kind of easier to understand this so what happens to the post consumer post consumer is after you use it after you consume whatever you have to you know the container what stored in the container what happens to the plastic waste so typically what happens is you throw it in the dustbin and then it gets collected by the municipality people in a truck or waste collectors are there people who walk around and collect the plastic waste they will segregate it they won't collect everything they will know they know which plastic to collect because some plastic yields lot of value for them and some the, some plastics do so they collect some of those and uh, they send it to what we the general term is a kabadi wala or basically a somebody who seg segregates this plastic waste by type as we saw in the thermoplastic slide plastics have different types so there is depending on the monomer you use and the type of plastic that you produce and what application you use there are different types of plastics so there are some very broad class like polyethylene and polypropylene polyethylene is further subdivided into high density polyethylene low density polyethylene linear low density polyethylene polypropylene is also you know further subdivided into some categories but these are all types of plastic so when you want to recycle it you first need to separate out this type you need a certain individual one or two you can't just mix everything and you can't expect that that tv chalega um so these kabadi wala so they segregated into a type individual type so they will accumulate instead of one bottle to bottle they like accumulate 10 kg 20 kg of this particular kind of hdp or milk bags milk bags are a certain type of plastics so they like segregate milk bags to go and then they will pass it on to the trader so trader what they do is the trader is a person who accumulates lot of this types uh waste collector will have like 2 kg of milk bags let's say plastic bags no? and the kabadi wala will have like 20 30 kg of plastic by the time it goes to the trader trader will get it from various places and they will have hundreds of kgs of plastic bags and then it goes to the recyclers recyclers what they do they wash remove other material they wash it they flake it or melt it and extrude it into pellets or bricks and things like that and then they make something else so this is typically what happens in a 
case of the thermoplastic sets. Thermo sets, it's a different. Since the thermo sets are very small percentage of the plastics we use, I'm not going to go too much into the thermo set. So this is this is a, what happens in there. So you, these, you see these polypropylene cans. So these are all uh, cans, oil cans, and these kinds of like you know cans which are collected in a waste collector, a trader center, trader's place, and then sent to the recycler. You see this. This is basically a shredder. It will shred it uh, this these cans into very tiny pieces. You see a pile of um, pile of uh, shredded material here, and then it is melted in an extruder, and you see this like you know in the bottom right corner you see it is being extruded into a uh, kind of a filament and then it is cut into small parts to make into a pellet so these are pellets made from recycled plastics so what they do they take these pellets and put it into an injection molding machine or an extruder to make whatever parts that they want to make for a mug or a, or a vessel to store water or whatever there are so many other things that you can make so this is another recycling center. You see, they have a lot of uh, plastic covers which are lying over here. And then it is washed, once again, shredded, melted into, they don't make pellets, they just make it into what, what they call bricks. So they, it's basically a mixed material brick of plastic, which goes on into manufacturing other items. So I'm going to spend some time in taking you through how a pet bottle gets recycled in India, just to give you an understanding of what happens. So PET stands for polyethylene terephthalate. It's a very, very uh, you know, the properties are so good that you know it is uh, it, it, in packaging up. You want to have a bottle which is clear, but it doesn't shatter. The, it doesn't actually, if you see, it's very difficult to pa pack uh, carbonated things. Carbonated drinks have, you know, carbon dioxide in them. No? So carbon dioxide will, if you store it in the inappropriate material, they will, the barrier properties of that material of the carbon dioxide might not be good. So the carbon dioxide will come out, will diffuse out. So in which case, if you open your, so, uh, you know, cola or whatever it is, there won't be any fizz, there won't be any carbon dioxide left in it for it to be. So, PET is a very good because the barrier properties to carbon dioxide is very good. So it stores. So it is very, uh, very popularly used for storing liquids and other packaging. So PET bottles, what are they used for? Have, roughly when I calculated this information in 2016-17, India, the total consumption of PET was about 950, 900 to 950 kilotons of uh, almost almost a million tons of PET was used, PET resin was used in India for packaging. So it is used for a wide range of, so you see carbonated, aerated drinks. So it has a certain shelf life, like for, for example, they make from the resin to the bottle and then by the time it reaches the, the waste stream, so if you are using it for carbonated drinks, it's about three months. So like that, we estimated what are the amount of time that it takes from the resin to the waste stream, what, what time it takes and what are the different applications. It is used for storing liquor, it is used for storing uh, pharma. If you go to the pharmacy and if you buy a small like, syrup or something, most likely it will come in a plastic bottle and that is a pet bottle. It will be amber around like brownish, very dark brown color what you know. That is a, that's basically a big one. And it is used to store oils and uh, you know, products and like, you know, all kinds of things, agrochemicals and everything. So by the one, once again, what happens is that, you know, you, they'll first separate it out into a uh, individual color also. So you see that some types of soda and cola and all, it comes in a green bottle. So they'll separate out the green bottle, they'll separate out the transparent bottle, and they'll separate out this brown bottle or the, what they call an amber. So it is separated by color. You see these big bags. These bags are, uh, when it comes to the trader, full of uh, plastic bottles. And you see a mountain of plastic bottles which is lying over here. And then uh, each bottle is picked up. And you see these women who are sitting and sorting this. Uh, 
So you can see, you can see I, if I zoom in, you will be able to see, but each of them has a small sharp knife in their hands. So what they are looking for is they are looking for bottles with aluminum caps or bottles with aluminum caps and rings and there are certain types of material called PVC labels. The, so the bottle has a cap, a neck ring into which the cap is attached to and then there is a label. So the bottle itself is polyethylene tetrahydride, but the cap and the neck ring is, for many of these applications, it is polyethylene or polypropylene. But in some applications, aluminum caps are used, but you can't recycle aluminum along with PET. You can recycle aluminum separately, but you can't do that. So they separate out the aluminum caps and rings. They separate out, some of these labels are made of either polyethylene, polypropylene, or uh, PVC. Polyethylene, polypropylene is not a problem because they can separate that easily. Poly PVC is a very difficult to separate from PET. Um, so these, these people remove these labels and caps and all that. And then they put it back. And then you see these men who are sitting in the back, they use this bailing machine. You see the, they've also separated out by color, whatever impurities are there. They remove the caps and the neck rings and all that. And people use this kind of a bailing machine, which basically it's a hydraulic press. You put a lot of bottles, you, because it's difficult to transport these bottles because it's a very lot of volume. Uh, so you try to make it denser by compressing, by bailing. And these machines are used. You see these compressed bales. These bales are then transported to the nearest. These trucks carry it to the recyclers. At the recycling center, what happens? They remove these bales and then they put them through a series of machines. You see one of the machines is a label remover. It will, it will rotate fast with a pointy or you know, screws pointing inside. So it will quickly remove the labels as much as possible because they don't want to contaminate it with the label material when they recycle this plastic. And then uh, there is a machine through which they put to remove loose parts. They put it under a magnet to remove any metallic parts. Why would there be metallic parts in plastic material? When you have these squeeze bottles, you have these like soap dispensers, shampoo, where you squeeze the top and then like the soap comes out, the liquid soap. So there is a spring inside. So similarly, in a lot of these plastic gadgets, there's a small metal part which makes it a spring or a cap or whatever. So that, can, that has to be separated out first. You can't put everything and then recycle. So you need to sort, separate out the single type of material for you to be able to recycle. So they, this factory removes all of that systematically one at a time. And then there are people who stand and spot. So there are, they want only PET bottles to go to the machine. They don't want PVC, polyethylene, they don't want polypropylene, they don't want other kinds of Visually, they are sorting it out. They are like looking at by look, they can tell whether it is a one type or the other. So they are removing it. And they are removing the aluminum caps. So then they shred it and then they wash it, and then they make something called as washed flakes on the top right corner, you see the white uh, you know, flaky material, they call it washed flakes. Basically, this is shredded polyethylene terephthalate after being washed and treated with, uh, so that it's, it's pure. And then the green bottles are separately sorted, and then they make fibers of it. So they put it in an extruder and the spinner, spinner spinning machine, Spinneret, and in the spinneret, uh, they draw fibers out of it. These fibers are used in a variety of applications. So this is basically polyester. When so PET is also a polyester, so they what they get is polyester fiber when you recycle this material. So this can be used for a host of applications. It can be used for, like for example, the when the World Cup happened in India, the India team cricket jersey, t-shirt that they wore was made from recycled. Pet bottles. So you get these polyester fibers and then you make fabric out of it. So there are various other applications that you can think of. Right? When you buy pillows earlier and all, uh, if you go to the market, they will have cotton stuff. Pillows. Cotton itself, there are different grades of cotton. And uh, so either cloth pillows or the rough cloth or cotton, and you know, these kinds of pillows you get. But if you go to a supermarket or a big uh, chain store and buy a pillow in this case. It will come, it's a nice fluffy pillow. No? So it's basically filled with polyester fiber. 
what they call fiber film. Um, so these fibers are filled into it so that it's a nice cushiony, it gives a nice cushiony. So all your stuffed toys, people who like stuffed toys, so all these stuffed toys are filled with this polyester fiber. So this polyester fiber can be made from what they call original material also. They call it virgin material. You can either make it from that original material or you can make it from this recycled fed bottom also. In India, we estimated that about 60 to 70 percent of the pet bottles used are recycled in the organized sector. Organized sector means they have a license, they have like you know, pay taxes, and these companies do all that. But a lot of recycling happens in an unorganized sector. Unorganized sector means like they have not really registered the company and it's mostly cash transaction. They'll be located somewhere outside, nobody knows where they are, but they will do the recycling. So it, that also happens. So more gets recycled through the unorganized sector, but we don't know how much. Um, and we estimated that in one year, 2016-17 alone, this recycling of PET bottles, just that in the organized sector, was estimated to be a 3,000 to 4,000 crore industry, which means there is a lot of money to be made in the recycling business recycling of plastics, recycling of various other items. As long as you are able to get the items in sufficient quantity and without getting too much other material mixed with it into a certain recycling. Okay. So we saw that in India, 60 to 70 percent gets recycled. In the organized sector, more in the organized sector. Uh, this is just a just to give a sense of how much pet bottles get recycled abroad. So in the US, it is about 31 percent. In the this was a few years ago. Now it is a little more. In Europe, it was about 59 percent got collected. The collection is different from recycling because they used to ship a lot of it out of India, out of uh, so export the waste out of their countries, but they can't do it anymore because there are a lot of issues are associated. But Japan, they do a lot of recycling. 93% of the pet bottles in Japan are recycled. So what, so pet bottle is a very highly recycled item. Not all plastics get recycled to the same extent as pet bottles get recycled. So what is so special about pet bottles? Why do they get recycled more? First of all, it's a large rigid item, so it's easy to identify. So people don't, it's easy to collect. And it has a very high density. Uh, so it has a very, which means like a bottle will contain uh, a lot by weight of this plastic. So this recycling business happens by kg, by how much weight of this plastic you have, so that too you can recycle. So this pet is a very high density, so you can like you know get to a benchmark like you know volume level, weight level very quickly. And there is a, it's quite widely used, so you can easily collect 10 kgs or 20 kgs of this material very quickly. And the properties are so good that even after one down cycle, down cycle means like you melt it and then you spin it into fibers in this case, but you melt it. When you melt, you lose some properties. Basically, you lose the molecular weight profile of the polymer goes down. Because of which the viscosity goes down. And because of which the other properties that the material has drops a little bit. So you should either do something to bring up the material property to the same level or use it for some other application, which for which you don't need such um, great properties to be a start. So I will skip all this. There are some rules that uh, the plastic waste management rules were brought into India. I mean, were introduced in 2016, the new ones. So I, I was going to talk a little bit about it, but I will skip it because we don't have too much time. I don't want to, I don't want to be uh, give a deliverance. It is too boring to talk about it. So I will skip it. Um, so energy recovery. Energy recovery is another, uh, as I said, Plastics are made from petroleum products. So they have an intrinsic calorific value. So if you look at the chart above, you see that certain plastics have a higher calorific value when compared to certain other plastics. 
So polypropylene. Am I audible? There's some mute. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes. Please. Yes, sir, yes, yes, please. Sir. All right. <laughs> It's good to hear some voices back because, like you know, when you are giving a talk on Zoom, like you know, you are talking to a screen for so long. It's nice to hear this. Thing. Okay, let's proceed. Uh, you can do energy recovery from, but you see that the calorific value of uh, plastics, you know, it's very comparable to. Uh, it's better than coal, and it's almost comparable to petroleum coke, slightly lesser than crude oil. So there is a lot of calorific value that you can get from. Meaning by burning, you can get a, you can use it for heating. So they convert water into steam and use the steam for various applications. Okay, what are the difficulties in recycling? Why it is difficult to recycle plastics as we use it? Technically speaking, recycling plastics is very, very possible. You know, it is not a great, uh, those problems were solved long back. But there are other problems that come and stop us from recycling. What are the problems? For example, the chips packet that you get. So look at the, the chips packet. Uh, I don't know if you realize there are many plastic layers in the chips packet. But the uh, bad news is it has like so many layers of plastic, different types of plastic. There is adhesive, there is ink, there is a layer of aluminum. So why do they need so many layers in a plastic bag, in a, in a chips packet? Because they need the chips packet to do so many things. They want the chips packet to be shiny so that people are attracted to picking it up. They want to be able to print a lot of things. So they put a lot of inks and you know, they make it colorful. They want certain barrier properties. They don't want moisture to get in. They want certain sealing properties so that the seals are very strong. So for each of these things, they add a different type of material. So at the end of it, what happens is you have a packet of packaging material, which has aluminum, plastic, adhesive, ink, and the different types of plastic sources. So then it becomes very difficult. How do you separate out this aluminum layer? You can see that it's only about 440 to 100 nanometer layer. So it's very difficult to separate out this aluminum from this plastic. So these are all some of the issues when you have multi-material packaging. Most material, most packaging applications that you have, or things that you see, are more, many of them have multiple materials, in it. and that makes it very difficult to use. So, for example, uh, I don't know. Uh, this is uh, you get Avin or whatever products you get in, uh, in, uh, in Tamil Nadu. So. Uh, you come, it comes in like, you know, these packets, these packets are okay. These are, these are made of a single, these plastic pouches. Pouches are fine because they are made in a, a single material. It's e slightly easier to recycle. Whereas they come in these containers, which are by itself is okay because they have one or two materials, types of material, which is kind of, you can work with it, but they also come with the aluminum ceiling. So they are, they are, if you buy a curd dabba, it is sealed with aluminum. There's a layer of aluminum on that. It's very difficult to peel it off completely. I don't know if you have succeeded peeling it off completely without breaking. So it's very difficult to do it. So when you throw the dabba out, so it is there that you have a material which has, you have a dabba which has plastic, you have a dabba which has aluminum and some adhesives. And so then plastic by itself is recycled. But the combination of these materials with difficulty in removing it, it makes it less recycled. Same, so you see these lassies come in these bottles. These bottles are mostly pet bottles. Uh, so they have a label cap and ring. Pet bottles are like recyclable, but they also come in these tetra packs. So this, this packaging has like four or five layers in it. So it has a plastic layer, it has a carbon, it has a cardboard layer or a paper layer, it has an aluminum layer, and it is sandwiched in such a way that it is a little more difficult to uh, remove individual layers. And it's a little more so this is just an example. I don't mean these products. I don't mean to point out these products or not. These particular packaging items, I'm just using this as an example. So this applies for all packaging applications. This is only used for illustrative purposes. 
Okay, so when they are choosing packaging, there are various things people decide why they what kind of material to choose. First, they need to protect. Second, they need to transport it. So it shouldn't when they pack the chips, no. So they want to. They also put some air in it, nitrogen or some kind of uh, air or nitrogen in it, so that it puffs up. If it doesn't, so it has to be puffed up because otherwise, you know, if you keep packing a uh, lot of chips packet one on top of the other, by the end you will get only like powder. You get chips powder. You don't get a chip potato chip. So they need to be able to transport it. They need to be able to put it on the shelf life as to be maintained. They have to like you know stay there on the shelf for like six months or eight months or whatever the shelf life of that. And it has to be convenient. Some jam, uh, for example, like some of these jams come in a squeeze tube because people like to like you know don't like to open the bottle and take a spoon, put it on, like, you know, they don't want to go through all these multiple steps. They just come with, like, a squeeze tube. So, but what that means is that changes the, how it gets recycled when you use different kinds of materials. So, traditional toothpaste, normally when you go and buy a packet of, uh, a tube of toothpaste, it has so many layers in it. It has polyethylene, it has a copolymer, it has aluminum, it has, like, uh, Another layer of polyethylene and like so many different layers in there. So it becomes once again a little more difficult to recycle these kinds of materials. But there are ways in which people have actually, so this is an example of a, of a company which made a very recyclable toothpaste tube by using these materials. Um, so they have combined a range of grades of a certain type of HTPE. To make it make to avoid multiple layers, and they made it with a single type of tube. So, whose responsibility is then to increase the recyclability of plastics? So, is it you or people who use it? Is it people who collect the waste? Is it people who design it? Or is it the government's responsibility? Or is it the manufacturers who make these? So if you ask me, this is my personal opinion, uh, everybody is responsible and everybody has to play a role. So it won't happen automatically or one person can't blame, one group of people can't blame the other group and say, because of them only it is happening. So you, you have to start thinking about recycling a particular material even before you make that material. What I mean by that is, for example, when designers, product designers, when they are designing what kind of material to use in a packaging application, they would have to think about how is it recyclable? How can I make it more recyclable? So there has to be certain guidelines and specifications that have to be put out by the governments and the regulatory bodies to make sure that these regulations, are if you follow these regulations, it will become easier to recycle. And uh, consumers also, when you use it, you are, you are not supposed to throw it out, like, you know, throw out into the, like, you know, just litter it, walk on the road, drink a can of water and a bottle of water and throw the bottle. So the bottle will never get recycled. It will just walk, get washed out. So consumers have the responsibility to put it in the waste stream and the municipalities have the responsibility to collect the waste stream also and uh, process it appropriately. So if, not, if one person also doesn't do their job in this chain, most likely that product will not get recycled. So all of every single every single orange hexagon you see here, each of those uh, set of people have to do have to take up responsibility in getting it recycled. So for example, what can you do when I say design? What do you mean by design? So I will give you some example that they follow in Japan. In Japan, if you have to make, if you are a manufacturer and if you have to make pet bottles, you have to follow these directions. What directions have they given? First of all, they have said you can't make a colored bottle. They have to be a transparent bottle, but sometimes the liquids are a little pale, yellow liquids and things like that. They don't, people don't like to look at. And so they come in colored bottles, like green bottle uh, is used to store. So what they have described in this link here, in this guidelines here, you make a label that covers the entire face of the bottle. The label can be covered, uh, colored, so, but the label can be removed easily. 
So that way you can increase the recyclability of this wet bottle. So that is one thing there. Second thing they have said for the cap and the neck ring of a wet bottle, you can use only a certain grade of material, certain types of material. And for the label that you see in the wet bottle, they have said you can't use PVC. You can only use only uh, certain grades of types of material. So if you follow all these instructions, you can't print directly on the using a, a ink, you can't print directly on the bottle. So these are all guidelines they have given, design guidelines. So if you if manufacturers follow all these guidelines, it becomes so much easier to recycle this bottle once the bottle is thrown away into the waste stream. So uh, this is an example of what product designers and the regulatory PR people uh, who put rules, like you know, this is what should be done. So, so they, if we follow some of these common rules, it becomes easier. Okay, this is rules for pet, but various packaging applications can come up where there will be where there could be various rules for a variety of these applications. These are some rules of thumb. So, is it what is more likely to be collected and recycled, and what is less likely to be collected? And recycled? If the type of material is single type of material it is more likely to be recycled or collected. If it has multiple materials in it, it is less likely to be collected because it is difficult to separate out these materials and it's so it becomes difficult to collect and recycle. If the size of the product is very small, it is very difficult to collect. For example, you go to the shop, corner shop, you buy a one rupee, two rupee chocolate, you open it, you have, you eat it, and that chocolate wrapper that you hold in your hand is a very hardly weighs a gram or two. And it has like so many layers. In it. it has an aluminum layer, it has a plastic layer, and so many things are there. So it becomes a difficult to recycle a very tiny uh, object and the, unless you keep accumulating this in a certain place and then recycle. So density is another problem. If you have a high density item, it is more likely to be collected and recycled. If you have a low density item, you have to do something more to make it recycled, to collect and make sure that it gets collected and recycled. So ease of separation. If you have two types of material, let's say that in this bottle, this cap is a different type, I can easily remove this. So it's, the ease of separation is not very difficult. So, I mean, ease of separation is there. So it is more likely to be collected and recycled. If the volume of the material being used is very high, it is more likely to be collected. So these are all some ways to think about it. Okay, so what are the issues with collection and segregation and recycling? So first of all, you need to separate out different types of waste. You start with wet waste and dry waste. Wet waste means like, you know, your vegetable peels and fruits and you know, flowers and Whatever is can be biodegradable, biodegradable is like compostable material. It has to be kept separately. You can't put everything in the same dabba. You can't put like you know your onion peel and your plastic items and your aluminum can and your cardboard and your paper everything in the same boy dustbin and expect that to be recycled. Expect that won't happen because it has like so much mixed material in it. You have to segregate it out first into wet and dry. Dry waste also, it is better to segregate it out into other types, but we'll come to that later. But when you put dry waste, you can make sure that it is not contaminated with other things. If you have food packaging, wash it once and then put it so that it is not contaminated with food. Milk bags, you can rinse it and put it. So these are all things that consumers can do. But I'm not saying consumers have the only responsibility to recycle this. Everybody has a responsibility. The municipality has a responsibility, consumer has a responsibility. The manufacturers have the responsibility. So consumers can do not litter. Don't like, throw away your plastic wrapper, your pop a chocolate in your mouth or a mint in your mouth and just throw it off. Drink a bottle of water and then throw. So throw out of the you know, train compartment, bus, you know, have something and then throw it off. If you throw all these things, it will never get recycled because it will just go and clog drains. Uh, so and then design people and like, regulations have to be in place. And everybody has to, it has to, so before you make the material itself, you need to think about how to recycle it, how to make it sustainable. 
you just what sustainability means is you can continue to do it in a meaningful way without affecting the uh, environment in an adverse way significantly what how we are doing things currently is not a sustainable way of doing things so where you can do whatever we want use whatever material we want use how much ever we want and discard it however we want this is not a very sustainable practice and it is uh, it, this cannot go on for too long you know it will we, we will come to a you know a point where like you know, this won't this can't continue the current mode of operation okay so i have a couple of slides i will stop soon so you people who are feeling bored don't worry the talk is going to end very soon uh, per capita consumption of plastics typically this is what happened has happened in the world over the last 50 years the more wealthy a country is the more plastics they consume on a per capita basis if you look at north america constituting of canada and the you know usa they consume about you know uh the 150 kgs or something of plastics in a year 200 kgs of plastics a year each person and that number varies to come to india we don't consume that much because the population is large and our consumption levels of plastics have not reached that now and there are some pockets where in villages people don't use for single use items or plastic items or the usage is very low but where as a city person just i'm thinking the amount of garbage that we create in a given day so the amount of it is unavoidable given the lifestyle and other things like that which we are forced to adopt but the fact is that we use a lot of plastics but not a lot when compared to other countries which are significantly richer countries we don't use as much plastics but we will the more the per capita income gdp per capita increases the more plastics each person will use and more pollution will be created imagine india using the level of what north america or like europe is using for our population it will create an enormous amount of plastic okay so see uh, a lot of these issues i just want to this is a conclusion summary a conclusion slide so if you want to recycle or like first of all we need to make sure that to understand that these are different materials plastic is a even within plastic plastic is not a single type of material people most people think plastic is like plastic like everything is plastic so all that is like you know they can think and identify it is a plastic that might be their way of looking at things but you can't recycle a mixed type of plastics you can't recycle polystyrene with polyethylene with polypropylene and for pet together in a pile you can't recycle it. you have to separate it out into a single type and you need to first of all make sure that the waste is segregated and the design people should do their job and the product designers should make sure that there are not too many layers or too many types of materials and then you should be able to accumulate this in a certain volume in a certain place and uh, then move towards what we call as a circular economy circular economy is where you take a, a batch of resin polyethylene terephthalate resin you make a bottle you discard it you take the bottle you make you kind of treat it either chemically or you can do chemical recycling or mechanical recycling with some additional steps to make a bottle again so you are sir you are basically achieved circular economy if you take a bottle and make a bottle again out of it after using it so we need to move towards that kind of a model where we have figured out systems we can't take for granted that materials will keep appearing and we can just keep using and discarding it as and when we please so we should all of us as a society should take some responsibility for how we use and consume these types of materials okay i'll stop here this is my contact details if anybody has any questions or something please email me or we can chat about it right i will stop sharing and if there are any questions i'll be happy to answer thank you dr magesh for uh, delivering the wonderful uh, lecture wonderful uh, 
ஐ ஓப்பனர் ஃபார் ஹவு டு யூஸ் பிளாஸ்டிக் சம் ஆஃப் த கொஸ்டின் மோஸ்ட்லி த கொஸ்டின்ஸ் ஆஸ்கடு ஹியர் ஆர் ரிலேட்டட் டு தி ரீசைக்லபிலிட்டி ஓன்லி வெதர் இட் கேன் பி பேண்ட் யூசேஜ் ஆஃப் பிளாஸ்டிக் கேன் பி பேண்ட் அண்ட் மை பர்சனல் கொஸ்டின் கேன் யூ ஹியர் மீ பிளீஸ் my the from the uh, that related to audience also you told no the seven packages seven uh, layers are there in the particularly for the tip packet to attract the uh, bright colors okay so is it uh, so how much money is involved in the making the product and compared to the packaging any idea do you have uh, i don't have numbers but, but percentage it's very yeah. insignificant so if you buy a packet of chips which is like you know 10 rupees is the packet of chips so the amount of packaging cost in uh, that is the price that you pay yes uh, yeah. the dealers get it probably at around 7 rupees and then the dealers sell it to the shop at 850 or something and there will be about 15% margin in each of these transactions and then so the company will the cost of production the The, uh, the the company will probably get about 6 rupees or 5 rupees from the from a packet of chips whereas you pay 10 rupees so the the 5 rupees that they get the cost of the material including the chips the packaging the air that they put in there and all that will not be more than 10 to 20% of the 5 rupees okay so the so the maximum is i'm just giving you an estimate so this is don't hold me to it but i'm just saying it won't be more than a rupee if you just look at the material cost there will be other costs there will be administration costs there will be salary and things like that like you know uh, but i'm just talking about the cost of material alone it's and not for like, the cost of packing be. cost of packing i am telling so, only so i'm saying cost of material itself will be about a rupee only oh, cost okay. of packing will be much much lower than that so like you okay. know it will be a few paisa okay. uh, it will be you know, you know what i don't know i don't know the exact Okay. these materials are so very very cheap that there is a reason why this gets used so much okay. so uh, these kinds of plastics which are getting used here is uh, you can get it for about uh, 80 to 100 rupees a kg and uh, there are and you can calculate what is the mass take a chips packet and see like you know so what is the weight of a empty packet of after you remove the chips from it and there is aluminum in it there is like you know aluminum is sells for about 70 rupees a kg and these plastics are about 80 to 100 rupees a kg so average weight let's say it's about average cost per of the material is about 90 to 100 rupees a kg you can calculate based on the weight of the packet of chips what would be the average cost of just the packing material of course there is processing cost and there are other things like that but it is not very significant so it is very very cheap so and it is very that is the reason why it gets used a lot because the solution you have a problem and when you have a very cheap solution to it people you want to take you, know, you are incentivized to take because like you want to they are these companies are there to make profit so they are not here to think about society at large and like you know that is all of our responsibilities and the governments and the regulatory bodies okay the, i am going to the questions from the audience yeah what is the difference between virgin and the recycled polymer pellets chemically are they same will there be any impurities in the recycled polymer like plasticizer stabilizer etc yeah so good good question. Question. see virgin polymer is when you take the feed stock so for example you take propylene and then make it into a polypropylene like you know you do the polymerization catalytic polymerization and you make polypropylene and so there that also is quality control is there in terms of you use certain catalysts so then how do you extract the catalyst or what is the presence of catalyst so there is ways in which they estimate those things but it's basically just pure polypropylene and the amount of impurities there is uh, very very manageable and very negligible so that is virgin material where you start from a petroleum raw material which is ethylene or propylene or like you know, and then you come to the polymer so that is, that is without without any additive without any additives additives are added later okay additives are added in the compounding stage so there are formulation people who will take this virgin material and they will add color to it they will add master batch 
they will add uh, to make it process you make it easily processable so for example when you injection mold this you want to make a lot of these bottles in a given day so for to increase the speed of that you need add some more additives so for like that like you know there are various reasons why you add additives so then it is a formulated material so you formulate this material and the raw polymer is there and then you add a bunch of chemicals to it additives to it and then you formulate it. and then you make a product out and then you use the product so when the product gets discarded and recycled or like melted again obviously it has all those things in it so in the case of pet bottles if you take a transparent pet bottle it doesn't have too many other additives in it the formulations are kind of manageable so when you are just making wash flakes out of pet bottles so then the impurity levels you will have to manage impurities there will be other things what is there in the bottle is one thing chemically but there are a lot of impurities which can get in the process when you are recycling it when you are storing this people hardly throw away these bottles no they will take a cola will come into the house and then it will get washed they will put oil and then it will get washed they will put something else and then it will get washed they will put something else by the time the bottle reaches the waste stream it has gone through like you know seven avatars of various things and like you know so so many contamination is there and uh, uh, when you throw a bottle you don't make sure that all the liquid is drained and uh, all the solids are drained all the food particles are like what so by the way so this kind of food removing is not a big issue because like they use a very so you use a very hot water and a good detergent you can remove food but there are other impurities that can get by so when you are processing this stream of pet if something else comes in some other type of polymer comes in and then that gets mixed it becomes difficult to so it has to be very uh, quality control has to be actively managed so that is the difference between a recycled and the virgin material but when you are designing applications for recycled material you consider all these things you expect the properties to be not the same level as the virgin material so you choose those applications so you don't choose load bearing material so for example if there is a you are making a certain plastic item you make sure it is not a load bearing property or like you know it doesn't come in contact with humans or like uh, uh, food applications and things like that so you avoid those applications and you choose those applications which are possible with the recycled polymer recycled polymer is different from the virgin material if you want to make it exactly like the virgin material it is possible but you have to take efforts to do that and it is costly and since it is costly not many people follow thank you next question sir is there any act law to ban plastic if yes at what causes see uh, there are many states around the country which have started banning certain types of plastics so there is no when you first of all we should understand what we mean by plastic so the just because it doesn't look like a plastic doesn't mean it is not a plastic there are 300 people on this call i can almost guarantee that 200 of you are wearing plastics right now if you are wearing a polyester shirt most of these t-shirts have blended polyester in it most of these shirts have blended polyester in it and polyester is a polymer and it is a plastic so you are indeed as we speak wearing a plastic and most of you are sitting on chairs which are not wooden chairs and there is a 90% possibility that there is a plastic component in the chair if you are sitting on a cushion chair the cushion is made of polyurethane foam and covered with the polyester fabric the handles are made of polypropylene and so you are indeed wearing and sitting on polyester and lot of plastics the shoes that you wear it has so many and the slippers and the sandals that you wear unless it's a pure leather chappal it is plastic and it is like in you know, some type of polymer even the hawaii chappal that you wear it is made of rubber so it is a type of polymer and uh, so when you walk into a when you sit in a car or go into a bus the the seats and the, the upholstery and so many the bumper and like you know so 
So what do we call, what do we mean when we say plastic? So what we imagine, I think the person who has asked this question, what they mean by that is, they are talking about plastics which you can easily identify, single-use plastics, plastic bags, cups, like, you know, these kinds of items. So there are so many ways in which plastics are hidden in your life. The toothbrush, every single toothbrush that we use and the toothpaste that we use contains plastic, made entirely out of plastics. So if you, can't, if you ban plastics, you can't operate. You can't live the life that you know. So what we, what we mean by banning plastics is how do we take responsibility for the materials that we use? We can't enjoy the benefits of plastics and start abusing plastics after the point. Like, so we should, when we, there are many, to come to your question, there are many states that have started banning single-use plastics. You can't use plastics for, as a shopping bag. Like, you know, you can't go to the shop and expect the shop owner to give you a plastic bag. So they have started using plastic spoons and forks and like, you know, polystyrene plates. And they have come up with a list of things, what they call single-use plastics. And they have started banning those materials. in a limited way, saying that these materials should not be used. So which is fine. So which is like, you know, which is a very positive and a good step to take. But that is not going to solve your problem. So just because you ban 5% of the plastics, which are very visible, doesn't mean that 95% of the problem is just going to go away because you don't recognize them as plastics. And uh, so these things happen. So you know, in some states, you know, governments ban plastic bags, they shopping bags. No? So they don't uh, give you plastic bags if you go to the shop. If you, the shopkeepers will give you something that looks like a cloth bag. They'll say it's a cloth bag. It'll have like, you know, it's kind of tiny, if you look closer, it'll have tiny holes in it. It'll look like a cloth bag and everybody's happy. It's actually woven, uh, non-woven polypropylene. And it is very much a plastic. And yeah. so just that you can use it a few more times before you discard it. But it looks like cloth, but it is not cloth. It is, it is made out of plastics. So it is impossible to completely eliminate plastics, ban plastics from every aspect of your life. But it is very possible to manage them more responsibly. Next question, will there be emission of any hazardous gases during the recycling process? Uh, see, there are two, three things here. One is when we say recycling, we are, what we mentally, I mean, what we imagine is mechanical recycling. You melt the polymer and you make it into something. So the temperature that is required to melt a polymer and to make it into something else is not very high. So the emissions that you are getting there has to be managed, but it is not a significant polluter. When the temperature goes up, the all kinds of gases get released and like, you know, so when you're doing chemical recycling and pyrolysis and things like that. So those have to be done in a much more controlled way and make sure the emissions are managed. So if you do that, you can reduce the emissions. Uh, you are muted, Dr. Jayakar. Why plastic are not allowed to open banning? I'm sorry, say that again. Why plastic are not allowed to open banning? Why it can't be banned in open? Again, the hazardous gas hitting. Why it can't be burned in the open? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, first of all, you know, burning anything in the, even burning wood in the open, it's not hazardous for human beings, but it's hazardous to the planet. The amount of emissions that you get from playing wood burning is like very uh, like significant carbon dioxide emissions come from wood burning. So that is a natural product you're talking about. So you are talking here we are talking about plastics. So just think about what you are burning. You are taking a petroleum product made from petrol and you are adding a lot of chemicals to it to make it like you know do a lot of things, additives and things like that. So you have basically have a cocktail of five to 10 chemicals, would you take some chemicals in your lab and go outside and just light a fire? So obviously you won't because like, you know, the amount of, you have no idea what kind of emissions will come out of it. So when the certain temperatures go up, 
and like you know these uh, carbon monoxide and like, so many other gases that escape when you are doing uncontrolled uh, heating of any chemical so treat it like a, a chemical that is safe to use that doesn't mean it is safe to burn it is a cocktail of chemicals that you are having in your hand and just like you you wouldn't set fire to your chemistry lab and expect nothing will happen to it so you can't set fire to random plastic objects also. so it has to be if you want to burn it you have to burn it in a controlled atmosphere so a controlled setup where the temperature is managed amount of oxygen supply is managed and uh, what emissions come out there will be filters to remove those gases uh, before it reaches the atmosphere in those setups it's okay to burn plastic but not in the water in when we burn plastics we get some nitrogen based gases Sir, is there any method practice in india to convert it into fertilizers when you burn plastics yeah we get some nitrogen based gases so whether it can be converted into fertilizers okay so see when you burn plastics lot of things happen so your nitrogen based gases is the least of the problem so it could be nitrous oxide could be one of the things that could be emitted but there are so when you but there will be very small quantity so if you are going to capitalize or like valorize that meaning create value out of that very small amount of nitrogen that comes out if you are looking at that there are so many other processes that where nitrogen is emitted so you should try to valorize those this will not be economically feasible for you to do but there are so many other processes and like where nitrogen is emitted or nitrogen can be captured and converted to ammonia or like you know so many once you convert it into ammonia you can make urea and like so many and other fertilizers that you are you want to make so nitrogen capture is a is an interesting topic to explore so you have the right instincts to ask this question but nitrogen that you get from plastic burning is not going to solve the problem meaning it uh, amount will be so little that it is just will be safe to just uh, remove it and just keep it somewhere else you won't have so much nitrogen coming out to valorize thank you next question is there any replacement material instead of plastic please replacement of material instead of plastic in the world yeah you should see the it is you can start exploring for each application what you want to do so the reason why plastics are so widely used is because they solve lot of problems if you store uh, if you take a plastic bag wow i mean a paper bag you make a paper bag you can store stuff but if you take a handle and pull it everything will fall down so you can't put like beyond a certain amount of we are we don't need and then you take this plastic or let's say you make a paper bag you put lot of things you keep it keep down there is a pool of water there suddenly it will the paper will dissolve so and then things will fall down so weight permeability of water and then like you know and so many other convenience and other issues are rolled into is what you are applying so you should look at it by application you can't don't look at it like can i replace all plastics with something else so that is not the right approach to take in this case you look at application by application for so this application what are the properties that are required can i substitute it with other materials or can i make it using a different type of plastic which can be which is more recyclable so ask those questions and try to find answers so i do as of now people have not figured a way where you can ban stop using every single ounce of plastic that is uh, that ever you have has been used and completely replace it with an alternate material if it they had found the alternate material it would have already been done so but the advantage is that plastics combine so many of these properties which make them so useful and so cheap that it's difficult very difficult to match those properties at the price point thank you next question is how pet is converted into polyester is there any name reaction for that pet is polyester yes it's a type of polyester yes 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 so there's nothing that is done to convert it you just they just melt it and uh, so because it's already a polyester it's a, just a jacked up properties 
so the polyester fiber that you get no so the properties that are required to make polyester fiber is slightly lower than the properties that are required of a polyester resin to make pet bottles so the properties are jacked up so so it is like you know it a so it is polyester so that is why it is it, when they melt it they make polyester fiber next question is almost like repetition why does polymers get degraded with the re each recycling cycle means that changes ch changes occurs is it due to changes occur so you should you uh, know you should uh, remind remind yourself what polymers are what plastics are made of plastics are made of these long chain molecules of a certain type so polyethylene is ethylene monomer and then you make a polyethylene and then you change the properties of the polyethylene you can make it htp uh, sorry high density polyethylene low density polyethylene and things like that. so you are you are talking about long chain molecules and the properties that you get from the molecule so the molecular weight profile or the, the molecular weight distribution as they call it in polymer science so they are talking about how long how much each chain in that particular sample of polymer weighs how long is it how much does it weigh what is the weight of each of these chains sometimes it's a very mono dispersed meaning all these chains are of roughly of the same size that's called a very mono dispersed material the polymer molecular weight distribution is very narrow there some materials have slightly broader distribution meaning some chains are long some chains are longer some chains are slightly shorter so you have a different each chain you have a certain profile you it comes as a if you plot the distribution it's a little broad so each material has a molecular weight distribution associated and the viscosity is a function of molecular weight and so that is also there. so when you heat when you melt these polymers what you are doing is you are applying temperature and making it go above a certain point in the presence of the various chemicals in where, which are there in the polymer already like additives in the presence of additives you are heating it up so what will happen is many of these polymer chains will cleave will become smaller and the distribution will broaden up so instead of having a narrow polymer molecular weight distribution you will have a broader polymer molecular weight distribution and uh, properties are a function of molecular weight distribution so your properties also change and if you want to bring back the properties you have to make sure that the polymer chains are like brought back to the same length roughly the same length again so they what they do is like in uh, the case of pet they do something called a solid state condensation polymerization to bring back the molecular weight to the old level at which it is desired and then they use it for bottles again so that is roughly what happens thank you next question is can we use waste plastic in pet as a fuel yes you can so it doesn't mean that like you know you start using it in your motorbike and stuff like that so is, that is not what I, that is not how it is done what it means is so it comes from petrol petroleum products are raw materials for making plastics and there are a lot of calorific value in different types of plastics some plastics are more some plastics are less so um, so some plastics are conducive to be used for energy recovery so when you are doing energy recovery you should do it in a controlled that possible you can't just you know use it in a random way like you know so it has to there are certain reactors where you build and certain boilers and like you know uh, certain temperature settings are put in at which point you can start recovering energy and make convert water into steam and so on but yeah it is it is possible to do it yes. and next question most of them use garbage bags for waste disposal Whether the garbage bags are made up of recyclable material? Yeah, the, see, these garbage bags per se, if virgin material is used, they are recyclable. But many of these garbage bags themselves are used from recycling, are made from recycling. So then the recyclability goes down a bit, but they are in principle recyclable. You can combine, but the properties will drop. So. the reason why many of these garbage bags look black because they add the additive to mask a lot of things because when they recycle it 
the, the color goes off. It looks a very awkward color. People don't like to look at it. So they put black pigments in it and then it completely turns black and you can't see a difference. It is made, most of these bags are made out, out of recycled plastic. Uh, next question, sir. Have you heard of starch bags made up of tapioca? It is good replacement for plastic. If so, please share some details. The only demerit of it is that they get dissolved as soon as they get drenched. Starch bags, starch based bags made yes. from tapioca. No? So, yes. starch is a, another opportunity that people are exploring. So one of the problems is it's costly and it doesn't meet all the properties of the plastics of what plastic bag typically does. So what is the source of the starch doesn't matter. You can pick any source that you that will work for you that you can get enough of. So tapioca can be a source and you can find some other source. So start with starch as an alternative and look at what the properties of starch and how it is comparable to these plastic bags, polyethylene, polyethylene, and how much of it you can manage. The sourcing of the starch, you can come from, you can look at various options. You can look at the cheapest option available to you. And if tapioca is the cheapest option, you can go for it. Is it correct that plastics are more safer at low temperature? Keeping the food items in plastic containers in fridges more safer than at room temperature or higher temperature? See, there is a range of uh, a normal, it depends on what type of plastics you are using. Not all plastics are, are safe for food using as a food container. So first of all, there might be a lot of food containers which have recycled plastic in them. So you should not be using because the quality control is very low. So it's good to spend a little more to get a you know, kind of a reliable plastic container for storing food. Storing food in the fridges, there are food grade containers which are very, very commonly used for uh, storing food at room temperature in the fridge and so on. And uh, some amount of, so plastic containers are used for packing food also. And sometimes the food is put in hot. Um, so there are, it also depends, once again, it depends on the type of plastic used. Some most plastics, which are food grade plastics can take that level of temperature, which is fine. But if the, it is not food grade plastic and nobody is watching those things. So there, it is not safe to store food. The last question, the, the polyester clothes, are they, uh, will they cause any harm to our body? No, there has been no harm that has been documented in using polyester clothing. And the, yeah, this is the fine now it's appeared, which is the most easily recyclable plastic other than PET? See, anything that you find in large volumes without getting mixed with other plastics is easily recycled. So, other than PET, if you look at these cans and all these are made of polypropylene and polyethylene, so they get recycled more because you can find a lot of it and uh, typically it doesn't come mixed with a lot of other material. So, polyethylene, polypropylene will probably come mixed. Large, mm -hmm. large volume, big items. Thank you, Dr. Magesh. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for your time and wonderful lecture. May now I request uh, Dr. Emmanuel to offer a word of thanks. Thank you, everyone, for your patience and uh, uh, the audience and the audiences for you know, sticking around for so long. Dr. Emmanuel. I myself offer the word of thanks. Is it, uh, Dr. Emmanuel, you have. Please unmute. Unmute, unmute, unmute. Yes. Emmanuel, Dr. Emmanuel, please unmute. He is speaking. Dr. Manuel, please. Ma'am, ma unmute me. Unmute me. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Please, yeah, please. I need to unmute it. Yeah, please. Uh.
Dr. Emmanuel from NCL. Yes. Yes. Good evening to all. Uh, it is my privilege to propose the word of thanks. First of all, I remember the Almighty God with gratitude for enabling us to organize this webinar with a huge number of participants in spite of the corona pandemic. I would like to thank the guest speaker, Dr. Magesh Nandakobar, for accepting our invitation and giving interesting lecture on recycling of plastics and achieving sustainability. We are sure that the lecture would be useful to all the participants. Thank you, sir. I would like to express my gratitude to the Vice Chancellor, Registrar, Dean, School of Science, Arts, Media and Management, Karnia University, for their constant support and encouragement to conduct webinars, symposiums and conferences. Especially, I thank Dr. Samson Esiraj, Head of the Department, who always encourages us and stay by our side to organize more webinars like this. I thank all the participants for making this webinar a grand success. Here I have to mention more than 900 teachers, students have registered and are attending this webinar. We hope the knowledge uh, you got in this webinar will be useful to your career as well as higher studies. Thank you very much, dear participants. Last but not least, I thank all my colleagues for their active participation in the promotion and conduction of the course uh, webinar. Especially, I thank the conveners, Dr. V. Vijayagan and Dr. N. Anandri for organizing such a wonderful webinar with a huge number of participants without any problem. Thank you all once again. Have a nice day. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel. So, Dr. Magesh, once again, I please convey my regards to Krishna Murthy because of my colleague to contact. Yeah. Kindly please can't, uh, convey me because. Now, I may request uh, Dr. Rajendra Kumar to just a closing prayer so that we can close this event after this closing prayer. Thanks. Dr. Rajendra Kumar. Dr. Immanuel, you can close with the closing prayer. Anandi, madam. Sir, let me do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful time. Uh, in this national webinar, uh, we thank for the resource person, uh, Dr. Mahesh, uh, for his valuable time and um, uh, for explaining all the details in a very detailed way. Uh, bless him and uh, his family members in this pandemic situation. We submit uh, his family uh, to be safe. And also, uh, I we would like to thank uh, for all the participants, huge number of participants, around 900 participants uh, through the Zoom as well as the YouTube. Uh, we thank you for this wonderful blessing. Bless everyone, those who have attended. And uh, uh, I submit all my colleagues in your hand. Please uh, bless, bless everyone. And thank you for all their cooperation. Uh, with a small prayer, uh, we ask this prayer in the name of name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Magesh, for your valuable time. We, we, we first will we'll meet again sometime. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Dr. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Wonderful Thank lecture. You, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So we can leave, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Whoever have given the feedback, you can leave, please. Once again, thanks, Dr. Magesh.